Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at ketamine, also known as Special K. Many of these videos in the pharmacology section will focus on a single drug used in the practice of anesthesia, its mechanisms of action, major side effects, things about them to take into consideration, how and why they're used, and some high yield details and clever ways to remember them. Think of this screen when you're done as your ketamine cheat sheet. So as always, let's get started with the type of drug, and ketamine is actually a derivative of fencyclidine, or as many people know it, a derivative of PCP. Its mechanism of action is that it inhibits NMDA receptors. Now the NMDA receptor is the N-methyl D-aspartic acid receptor. It's a type of glutamate receptor, which is a type of excitatory receptor in the central nervous system. And since we block this excitatory receptor, it causes the opposite effect, leading to sedation. Now, dosing for ketamine varies greatly, and you can kind of see I cheated those little, you know, uh, words in there, IV induction, IM induction, pain, adjunct. And this is because depending on the route of administration and the purpose changes the dose. What I mean is that for IV induction, has a different dose than an IM induction. And those are different than the adjunct dose, which is then different from the pain dose. So I'm just going to write them out here. The IV induction dose is about one to 4.5 milligrams per kilogram. Whereas the IM is much higher at 6.5 to 13 milligrams per kilogram. Now, oftentimes we refer to IM ketamine as a ketamine dart, and it's oftentimes used for pediatric patients and sometimes the mentally disabled who won't allow you to place an IV, but you need a way to sedate them before bringing them into the operating room. You put a needle and then you inject it directly into the muscle and it helps them to relax and oftentimes we'll just in general put them to sleep. Now, we also commonly use ketamine as a great pain medication, especially in those patients with a history of chronic opiate use. So it kind of helps reset those receptors. But now more recently, even intraoperatively, so as to reduce post-operative opiate use, we use ketamine as a drip and even during the case. We can do it with 0.5 to 2 milligrams per kilogram per hour. And like I said, we can run this intraoperatively, we can run it in the PACU, or we can run it in the ICU. Finally, as an adjunct, we use it at low doses with our general induction agent, usually propofol, and I've seen it used at doses of around 50 to 80 milligrams at a time. Sorry, and I know that's a lot, but ketamine really is a great drug with a lot of different uses, and it's probably the closest thing we have at the moment to a perfect IV anesthetic, but we'll, we'll go over that more at the end. Now, for duration of action, uh, ketamine given IV usually works for about five to 10, sorry, that looks like a three, five to 10 minutes at a time. Now I do wanna make note about something regarding its pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics is that ketamine is extremely lipid soluble, which leads to its very rapid onset. Basically, since it's more soluble in lipids than in water or fluid, it has a tendency to move through the lipid bilayer into cells and its target receptor instead of staying in aqueous solutions. Now, ketamine is metabolized by the liver, which I'm my terrible drawing of a liver here, and it's metabolized to norketamine, which we all should know is an active metabolite, but it is far less potent than its normal original form. So, let's move on to systems now. First, the cardiovascular system. Ketamine increases blood pressure, increases heart rate, and as a result, increases our cardiac output. And this is via its sympathomimeta effects, via our endogenous catecholamines. Now, at the same time, very importantly, ketamine can act as a direct myocardial depressant. 
Now, we don't really see that as much because of the sympathomimetic effects of the drug, but when patients are, say, in the ICU or are catamine deplete, catecholamine depleted, let's say, you may see actually a depression of the cardiac output as opposed to an increase that we see with the sympathomimetic effects. As far as the central nervous system goes, it used to be thought that ketamine led to an increase in ICP or intracranial pressure, but recent studies have found that it actually may reduce ICP and as a result may be good in patients with brain lesions or bleeds. It should also be known that ketamine may lead to myoclonus or myoclonic jerks, which are quick involuntary muscle jerking. Now, it can also be used as an anti-seizure medication, but that's really only when all of our other swath of medications don't really work. Kind of a very, very last resort. Now, probably one of the most famous effects of ketamine, and many may not consider it a neuro effect, but I feel like it kind of fits in here, is the unpleasant psychogenic effects that it produces, notably extremely lucid dreaming and or nightmares. And this can be extremely offsetting and off-putting for patients who receive it, especially when they come out of anesthesia. Now, from a respiratory point of view, the most important thing about ketamine is that it does not decrease respiratory drive. What this means is our patients do not stop breathing when they receive ketamine. And that's a huge plus as far as our induction agents go. That being said, and this may also meld kind of with the nervous system aspect, is that ketamine preserves our upper airway reflexes. Our cat, cough, our gag, etc. meaning that patients still do those things, but it should be noted that it does not mean that they actually have the ability to protect their airway, and in this case can lead to aspiration. In fact, patients may be even at a slightly higher risk for laryngospasm as ketamine does cause an increase in secretions. And those increase in secretions can irritate the vocal cords and ultimately lead to um, laryngospasm. And then finally, ketamine is a bronchodilator, which makes it a great drug for patients with reactive airways like asthmatics and COPDers. And you'll oftentimes see it in children that need to be intubated, say in the emergency room who are having asthma attacks because it doesn't stop them from breathing on their own, but also helps relax the airway. Now onto the other systems and miscellaneous. The big thing here to really discuss is the near perfect IV anesthetic, at least the closest thing that we have. As I discussed in my video, the ideal anesthetic, we look for a number of qualities that an IV induction agent should have in order to be a great drug. Ketamine, as it turns out, fits most of those qualities. It's cheap to produce, it's titratable, it's quick on and quick off. It produces both anesthesia and analgesia and has minimal effects on the neurologic, cardiovascular, and respiratory systems. Obviously, there are other qualities that we look at, and I encourage you to take a look at that video to see them all, but ketamine really is a great drug. The unwanted side effects of hypersalivation, as well as the sympathetic reaction many experience and lucid dreaming, hold it back from being ideal, but it's pretty close, and we can usually attenuate most of those side effects, like the salivation with glycopyrrolate and midazolam for the hallucinations and dreams. Ketamine has been coming more back into the spotlight for perioperative analgesia and general medication as we move towards a practice that diminishes the use of narcotics. So that's all for ketamine. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact us. Click on the link below to subscribe. Follow us on Instagram at Count Backwards from 10. And as always, stay tuned for the next video.